Hello everyone. Welcome to the 416 on this Friday, December 11th. My name is Anna Belmonte and I'm the Director of Communications at Troy UMC. On Fridays, we are wanting to try to delve a little deeper into the theme for the upcoming Sunday's message. And you probably don't know this, but I'm actually the one who puts together the message notes for Sunday morning. So I get to read Andy's sermons ahead of time, which really helped me to formulate my thoughts for today. So the theme for this Sunday is that Jesus came to transform you. And I'm sorry if there's a little bit of noise in the background. The washing machine is running and my cat is eating over there. So we'll see. Anyway, so Jesus came to transform you. Now, I believe I talked a little bit about why and how we live for the Lord in my in my first 416 way back in the spring if you can remember that time so long ago um but living for the Lord involves transformation by the Holy Spirit and as I read through the upcoming sermon I felt like I should talk a little bit more about who the Holy Spirit is to us and so two themes really stood out to me and I couldn't pick between the two, so I'm going to talk a little about each. And these themes are, one, that the Holy Spirit is our greatest gift, and two, that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. So first, the Holy Spirit is our greatest gift. Um, and I want you to think for a minute, what is your favorite gift that you've ever received? I know that's a hard question. Um, and that can be a physical gift, or it can be an experience type of gift. It can be from when you were little, or it can just be last year. So take a moment to think about what's the most special gift that you've received, and what made that gift so special. How did it affect your relationship with the person who gave it to you? The thing that I've always considered my most prized possession is my cello. Um, my parents gifted it to me when I was in high school so that I could continue my love of learning and playing in um, musical groups with my sister who played the violin. Um, my parents enjoyed attending the um, our performances and though it was like a lot of extra work for them because they would drive to drive us to lessons it's kind of expensive and all that but they you know they did all that for us for both of us um, and they love to hear us play and now even though my cello isn't really a high value for being a musical instrument it was what my parents could afford so for me it's it's more than just an object it signifies the love of my parents and my love of music so now that you've had a minute to think about what your most treasured gift is, feel free, if you want to, to share in the comments. Oh, my cat is right here. Well, we'll take a, a cuteness break. This is one of my cats, Moses. He doesn't want to be, he doesn't want to be seen right now. Um, he's called Moses because uh, my parents found him uh, by a stream. It wasn't really that close to a stream, but they found him stranded. By himself as a baby so they called him Moses so anyway um, so I'm gonna switch a little bit here and don't don't worry I'm gonna get back to the idea of gifts but I want you to think for a minute and imagine what what an amazing gift it was for the people of Jesus generation that the Son of God was born in their generation and not only that but his disciples got to be his close friends and companions. They got to live life alongside him. They got to sit frequently under his teaching. Um, it's hard to imagine being in a situation where, you know, imagine Jesus being the guest speaker at our, at our church, something like that. Um, it's hard to imagine how we would react to that because it's just too awe-inspiring. Um, and it, yeah. Um, that feels like the best scenario, right? But, believe it or not, that's not the very best thing that we can experience. 
before his ascension, Jesus told his disciples that it would be better for him to physically leave them so that the helper could be sent to live within them. Now I'm going to read a, a portion of scripture from John 16. I'm going to read um, verse 7, thir- part of verse 13 and verse 14. And I'm reading from the Amplified Bible because it adds a few extra names for the Holy Spirit in there. Hold on, let me make sure I got the right one. Okay. Jesus is speaking here to his disciples. But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the comforter, the advocate, the intercessor, the counselor, and the strengthener will not come to you. But if I go, I will send the Holy Spirit to you to be in close fellowship with you. And skipping down to verse 13. When he, the Holy Spirit, or the Spirit of Truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth, full and complete truth. And he will disclose to you what is to come. He will glorify and honor me, because he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and will disclose it to you. So the Holy Spirit was Jesus' parting gift to his disciples. While they sat under Jesus' teaching, there were many spiritual truths that they didn't understand. Just think about the parables, that they were constantly asking what what the meaning of the parable was. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to guide them into the truth and to disclose the things of God directly to them. So Jesus' disciples were sorrowful when he said he was returning to his Father, but Jesus knew and told them about the greatest gift that they would receive after he left which is his very spirit within them. And we inherit that gift too when we become Jesus' disciples. I think we too easily lose sight of the immense value and awesomeness of the Holy Spirit. I mean, this is the same presence of God that caused Moses' face to shine, not my cat Moses, but you know what I mean, and that filled the temple with glory. It's the same spirit that descended on Jesus as a dove and on the apostles as tongues of fire. This is the same spirit that visited the Roman centurion's household and shook the room where the New Testament church gathered. I think we become so comfortable with God's presence with us that we forget to be amazed and grateful for the gift of all gifts. Remember, this is the same God who dwells in unapproachable light, whose holiness is totally incompatible with our sinfulness. Yet, because he loved us, God made a way for his spirit to live within us. Peter concluded his great sermon on the Temple Mount by saying, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit makes his home in us, we won't just sit idly by. We can expect to undergo serious transformation, which gets into my next main point, which is that the Holy Spirit is our counselor. Now I want to read a verse from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this was actually recently one of my memory verses, um, and so I had to include it. Let's see. And we all with unveiled face, continually seeing as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are progressively being transformed into his image from one degree of glory to even more glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Did you catch that? This progression of becoming more and more glorious like the Lord comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. We don't transform ourselves. We simply behold the Lord and the Spirit transforms us into his image. And that seems very mysterious and vague, but I think it's also meant to be practical. Um, Now, my band is working through an Advent study from Lifeway Women, and there's a quote in it on page 57. Let me read that to you. It says, let's remember that the act of our will is submission to the Spirit. 
We can never fix self with more self. We are transformed when we submit to our counselor. Let me read that again. Let's remember that the act of our will is submission to the spirit. We can never fix self with more self. We are transformed when we submit to our counselor. Counsel can be ignored or it can be received. Just the same as a human counselor doesn't help us unless we submit to their expertise, our holy counselor requires us to submit to his guidance. We cannot experience soul level transformation by exerting ourselves more. We can't fix self with more self. We must use our will to humbly submit ourselves to God's will. I know, at least for me, it's easy to think of the Holy Spirit as a comforter. And that, that's true, it's one of his many roles. But he is also our counselor. God knows what is best for us. In Psalm 23, we see that he leads us on paths of righteousness. But are we following his counsel? Do we look for his leading? We cannot experience transformation unless we continually make an effort to set our hearts and minds on the Lord and to submit to his spirit within us. I will go ahead and close with a prayer based on Galatians 2, 20 through 21. I found um, a little shell of a prayer and I added some things into it specific to this talk. So if you would go ahead and uh, pray along in your hearts with me. Lord, I have been crucified with you, so it is no longer I who live, but you who lives in me. Thank you, Father, for sacrificing your Son, so that I can receive the gift of all gifts, your Holy Spirit within me. Help me to cherish this gift and share it often with others. Because of your great grace and mercy, I am free from trying to fix myself with myself. I have a divine counselor. Help me to submit to my counselor's guidance so that I may be transformed from the inside out to be more and more glorious like my Savior. Amen. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in to today's 416. Um, I hope that you will tune in, have a great weekend and tune in on Monday to hear a word about the same message about transformation following the sermon. So we'll see you then. Bye-bye.